But we actually have to start tonight with some breaking news um, related to the special counsel's in, uh, indictment of Trump on those uh, classified documents charges. When special counsel Jack Smith brought those 37 federal criminal charges against Trump earlier this month in the classified documents case, remember these were charges for uh, willful retention of national defense information at his home in Florida, also uh, false statements and obstruction. You might remember in the indictment, there was sort of at length uh, detail given of a supposed audio recording of Donald Trump. Oh, Lordy, there are tapes. Um, according to the indictment, there is a tape from July 2021 when Trump was at his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey. And according to the indictment, Trump, in this recorded conversation, he's allegedly speaking with a writer who's working on a book about the Trump administration. And according to the indictment, during that conversation, Trump seems, at least, to show this writer some documents that he says are classified. Now, you can't do that. A, you shouldn't have classified documents after you leave the presidency. Uh, but B, you shouldn't be able to show them ever to somebody who's not um, got proper security clearances and a need to see them. The indictment quotes from this supposed tape. Um, it describes Trump showing the writer a piece of paper and allegedly saying, quote, I just found, isn't that amazing? It's like highly confidential, secret. This is secret information. As president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. <laughs> it's crazy, right? I mean, if you were inventing <laughs> like cartoon level, you did it wrong allegations, uh, for somebody mishandling classified information, you'd like this. You dream this up as a hypothetical to teach 1L law students, right? Imagine there was a tape in which the which the the accused said, "No, I'm not supposed to be showing this to you. It's really secret." But look, here it is. I mean, it's just a prosecutor's dream to have something like this on tape. But all we could see in the indictment was prosecutor's allegation that this tape existed and that on this tape, Trump said those things. And, you know, as an allegation, it's damning. The, the, the special counsel is alleging that Trump improperly held on to classified information. Here, allegedly, was, was this description of audio evidence of Trump appearing to admit that he was in possession of secret material, that it's not declassified, it's classified material, and he's nevertheless showing it to people who are absolutely not cleared to see it at this meeting, at his golf course. Thanks to the indictment, we've all read the transcript of that supposed recording. But now tonight, we can all hear it. Because CNN Tonight, and kudos to them for nailing this, um, CNN Tonight has obtained the auto recording, audio recording of Donald Trump, um, in which he appears to tell a writer that he is knowingly in possession of classified material. Now, I should tell you that this is CNN's reporting. NBC News has not authenticated this recording. But if what CNN has obtained is legit, what it appears to be is the tape that's described in the indictment. The evidence that helped lay the groundwork for special counsel Jack Smith to indict Donald Trump. So here it is. Uh, I'm going to play the whole thing for you now. Listen. These are bad, sick people. That, but, that was your coup, you know against you. That's well, it started right at the like beginning. Like when Millie's talking about, oh, you were going to try to do a kick. No, they, they were trying right. to do that before you even were sworn in. That's right. Trying to yeah. overthrow yeah. your election. Well, with Millie, uh, let me see that. I'll, I'll show you an example. He said that I wanted to attack Iran. Isn't it amazing? I have a big pile of papers. This thing just came up. Look. This was him. They presented me this. This is off the record, but they presented me this. This was him. This was the Defense Department and him. Wow. We looked at him. This was him. This wasn't done by me. This was him. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. It's pages long. Look. Mm. Wait a minute. Let's see here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just found. Isn't that amazing? This totally wins my case. You know. 
Mm -hmm. Except it is like highly confidential yeah. <laughs> secret. This is secret information. But look, look at this. You attack, and Hillary would print that out all the time. You know? <laughs> send it, no, she'd send it to yeah. Anthony Weiner, yeah. yeah. the pervert. Um, by the way, isn't that incredible? Though? Yeah. I was just saying because we were talking about it, <laughs> and you know, he said he wanted to attack Iran and what. And he's in the papers. Oh, this was done by the military, given to me. Uh, I think we can probably, right? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to try to figure out a, a, yeah. See, as president, I could have declassified yeah. it. Now I can't, you know, but this is yeah, classified. Now we have a problem. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's so cool. I mean, it's so, I'm look, we hear I have a, and you probably almost didn't believe me, but now you believe me. No, it's, I believe It's incredible. You. Right? No, they, hey, bring some, uh, bring some Cokes in, please. Bring some Cokes in, please. That does give it at least the ring of authenticity, doesn't it? I'll show you an example. Look. All sorts of stuff. Pages long. Look. This was the Defense Department. All sorts of stuff. Pages long. Look. This is secret information. Look. Look at this. He wanted to attack Iran. These are the papers. Trump has since tried to say in subsequent interviews, there was no document. I wasn't showing anything. It was just newspaper articles and magazine articles. This was the Defense Department. These are the papers. This was done by the military and given to me. Uh, I think we can probably write staffer. I don't know. Well, we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to. Uh, Trump, declassify it. Trump, see, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is classified. Isn't that interesting? It's so cool. Can we get some Cokes? I mean, let's just drill down on the specifics of this for a second. In Jack Smith bringing charges against Donald Trump, the, the sort of crux of the case, right, um, is that the, the prosecution has to be able to prove that Trump had classified documents in his possession after he left the presidency, right? That's the illegal activity alleged in the indictment. And here in this part of the tape is Donald Trump saying he had possession of classified information after leaving the presidency. Except it is like highly confidential yeah. <laughs> secret. This is secret information. <laughs> Highly confidential. This is secret information. <laughs> this is secret information. Look, look. Look at my secret information. It's one thing to sort of read these words as part of the indictment. It's another thing to hear it. Um, another key part of Jack Smith's case against Trump is proving not only that Trump had these documents in his possession, but that he knew that it was no longer in his power as an ex-president to declassify them, right? So, again, part of his sort of purported defense or part of his attempted defense, if you could even call it that, it doesn't even seem that coherent, is to say, yes, these things were classified, but I used my mind to declassify them. Here he is on tape admitting that he does not have the power to declassify these things, and these are still classified. Yeah. See, as president, I could have declassified yeah. it. Now I can't, you know, but this is yeah, classified. Now we have a problem. Isn't that interesting? As president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is classified. Isn't that interesting? It's so cool. It's a lot of things. I'm not sure cool is like in the top 6,000, but this is definitely the kind of thing that sounds like it should end up in a federal criminal indictment. I'll give you that. Joining us now is Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. She's a professor at the University of Michigan School of Law. Barb, thank you very much for being with us tonight. I'm so glad we were able to get you here uh, for this story with this late breaking news. Oh, glad to be here, Rachel. So let me just get your top line reaction. We obviously had some of this uh, tape um, described in the indictment line for line. There were some ellipses in the indictment. Not every line that's on this tape was reflected in the indictment. Um, it strikes me as potentially important when, when Trump says explicitly, these are the papers. 
um, which would seem to cast no doubt on whether or not he was actually holding papers that he was describing to this writer. But as a prosecutor, as a former prosecutor, as a lawyer, how do you hear this as evidence? Well, I have two reactions to it. One is, as a former prosecutor, it makes my hair stand on end a little bit to see this in the public domain. Prosecutors try to keep this stuff safeguarded so that you can't have witness tampering and crowdsourcing of defenses uh, now that people can because this is in the public domain. But as a matter of evidence, this is some really powerful evidence. We had seen some uh, verbatim quotes from this recording that was in the indictment, but to hear the whole thing play out, I think, is incredible evidence. And at trial, it will not just be this recording that's played in a vacuum. They will have to authenticate this document with, with this recording with someone who was there. So whether it is the biographer or the publisher or one of the two staffers, one or more of them will have to be there. And one question I think they'll be asked is, did you look at it? Because it sure sounds like he's showing it to them and they're actually reading it. So uh, I think it proves a couple of things. One, as you said, his knowledge and intent, which is important here, about that he is willfully violating the law. And the other is the incredible recklessness with which he is treating our national secrets. So it's a very powerful piece of evidence. And Barb, let me just ask you about one of those points that you just made about the, the fact that it, it seems when you hear this back and forth, it seems like the person who he's in conversation with is looking at the documents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I got the sense of I got sort of that as a vague impression from reading it in the indictment, hearing it. That seems much more clear. Again, that that part of the tape, I have a big pile of papers. This thing just came up. Look, this was him. He's talking about Mark Milley. They presented me this. This is off the record. But they presented me this. This was him. This was the Defense Department and him. And then the person he's speaking to, the writer says, wow, as if they are looking at the thing that he is imploring the person to look at. This wasn't done by me. This was him. All sorts of stuff. Pages long. Look. When the writer, the, the other person in the room says, wow, it, it does appear that he wasn't just, you know, waving it in the distance, showing that papers existed, but rather asking the person to view the content of that material. And, and that does, just as a lay person, makes me wonder why dissemination of classified material um, wasn't charged. It does seem like they've got evidence that he showed it to at least one other person. Yeah, that's how it lands with me as well. And as we said, I, I think they're going to call that witness. You know, they got this recording from somebody. My guess is it came through some sort of grand jury subpoena or request from the person who was in the room recording it for the purpose of gathering information for this biography. And so certainly it is a separate crime to disclose classified information to a person who is not authorized to receive it. That could be another charge. Now, my guess is this occurred in Bedminster, I believe, in New Jersey. And so it would be technically improper to charge it in Florida because there would not be proper venue there. But I know some have suggested perhaps this is a charge prosecutors are keeping in their pocket that could be filed in a separate indictment in the District of New Jersey. So that's one possible theory for that. Barbara McQuaid, invaluable to have you here tonight. Thank you so much, Barb. Let's have some Cokes. <laughs> All right. We'll send out for them. So the fighter jet forces this passenger airplane down. It lands at Minsk. Nobody knows why. But once they're on the ground, Belarusian police storm the plane and grab a guy, a 26-year-old blogger. He was the editor of a telegram channel that was critical of Belarus's dictator and um, was supportive of the protests that had sprung up in that country the previous year in 2020 after Belarus's dictator really did appear to have lost an election, but he decided he was going to stay in power anyway. It, I mean, it's an amazing thing, right? In, in modern day Europe, this dictator used a MiG fighter jet to force down a European commercial flight that wasn't even supposed to be landing in his country. He forced that plane down into his country specifically to get this kid off the plane so he could throw him in prison. The Belarusian dictator did that. Um, his name is Alexander Lukashenko. And even if you've never heard of Lukashenko, even if you have never in your life given one thought to the country called Belarus, I swear, he is exactly what you are imagining when you think to yourself, what does a Belarusian dictator look like? Just imagine, right? Look, magic. <laughs> exactly that guy, right? Giant, like, comically oversized military hat. 
regulation size and shape, Saddam style dictator mustache. He likes to be seen holding guns of all shapes and sizes, just randomly and for no reason, makes him feel like a big man, almost as big as when he wears the big hat. During the nationwide protests against him in 2020, after he stole that election, uh, he put on fake military gear, the kind of generic like Amazon Prime branded stuff that gets called tactical because it has extra snaps. <laughs> he put on this little fake military suit and walked around to try to get tough guy points against the women and students who were protesting against his dictatorship in 2020. Alexander Lukashenko is technically the elected president of Belarus, but he was elected in 1994. And he's been there ever since. He's the longest serving dictator, I mean president, in Europe. And it's not because he keeps getting reelected in free and fair elections. And you know, forgive me for saying it this way, but as dictators go, Alexander Lukashenko is kind of a sad sack nutball. He's, he is as weak as he is brutal, which is a bad pairing that goes together all too often. For Lukashenko, the main hallmark of the later stages of his reign as the longest standing dictator in Europe um, is not just that he kills and oppresses his own people and aggregates all the wealth and potential of his country to himself and his family. It's that he's, he's, he's bowing and scraping subservient to Vladimir Putin and Russia. He is as brutal as he is weak. But the relationship between Lukashenko and Putin has led to some real weird, weirdness, especially in recent months, especially after those protests that could have toppled Lukashenko, but they didn't, especially after Putin sent in forces to reinforce Lukashenko against the people protesting against him in his own country. Since then, Lukashenko and Putin appear to have been trying to create some kind of super state of their two countries one in which Belarus is sort of more or less willingly subsumed into Russia. This has led, just within the past couple of weeks, to Russia moving nuclear weapons into Belarus. Now, that's a big deal. I mean, when the, the USSR dissolved in 1991, all the former Soviet states, except for Russia itself, gave up their nuclear weapons. This very recent, this month, transfer of nuclear weapons from Russia into Belarus, that's the first time Russia's moved nuclear weapons outside its borders since the USSR collapsed. And it's not like Lukashenko is like a real stable genius in terms of, you know, feeling comfortable that he's now in control of these things. On the occasion of receiving these nuclear weapons, what did Lukashenko do? Well, he gave a bizarre statement to the press in which he said if any other country wants to join in this new union he's making with Putin, they should just call him up. He said, I'm not speaking for Putin here, I'm just speaking for me. But he says he's pretty sure they'd be happy to take anyone, any other country. So if you want to bring your country into this new union with Russia and Belarus, Lukashenko says, in return for you joining their union, he'll give your country nuclear weapons as a thank you. Again, he said he wasn't speaking for Putin, but he's pretty sure Putin would go along with it. Anybody wants to join our club, I'll give you nukes. This is within minutes of him getting nukes. So I know this is not a part of the world we usually pay much attention to, right? There's no big like Western news bureaus in Minsk that we're all taking live shots from on Monday nights. But in recent months, things have been getting increasingly weird in that corner of the world under that increasingly weird, weak, unstable dictator. And now, all of a sudden, that guy is the trusted authority. He's the calm hand. He's the man who the world is apparently entrusting with stopping a civil war in the largest country on the planet. That guy. <laughs> 